I would like to invite you to turn with me today to our study in John chapter 15 verses 4 through 7. John chapter 15 verses 4 through 7. These are the words of Jesus just before his crucifixion. He says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Jesus here talks about abiding with him. To abide with Jesus means to live with him. This is not just some kind of a casual contact. Oh no, this is not where just two strangers meet together. Sometimes people, they rent a house together and they actually become they're strangers in the house. They don't even know each other. But no, this is a type of abiding means to live together. It is to have a relationship as friends. And you know, Jesus is our friend. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, it talks about a friend that sticketh closer than the brother. Well, Jesus is this friend that sticketh closer than the brother. But we must be able to have a good relationship with him. He says that we are to abide in him just like the vine ab abides in with the branches. They are together. They are close together. They're actually part of each other. It's amazing when the root of the vine stalk, as it's growing there, it gives life to all the branches. But you know what the branches do? The branches are out there in the beautiful sunlight and they are receiving that sunshine and in, through their leaves it changes the, everything into chlorophyll and brings nutrients right back to the root. One exchange with the other. There is a relationship that we are to have. We are to receive from Christ and in turn we are to send Him back praise and thanksgiving. But now, in our to have a good relationship with somebody, there must be some type of communication. You know, we cannot have a build up a friendship by only one-sided. You know, when you have two people and one's always talking, 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 the other one just listens, they don't develop a friendship. To develop a friendship, you actually have to have a two-way communication. Sometimes there's talking, sometimes there's listening, sometimes there's sharing personal experiences, but there is a two-way communication. Now, we have been talking quite heavily about listening to what God has to say. We've been talking about listening through His Word, hearing the Word of God speak to our souls. But what about communicating back to God? In this wonderful book called Steps to Christ, Steps to Christ on page 93, I would just like to read two paragraphs here about communication. Steps to Christ and page 93. It says, Through nature and revelation, through His providence and by the influence of His Spirit, God speaks to us. So these are the ways that God communicates with us. But these are not enough. We need also to pour out our heart to Him. In order to have spiritual life and energy, we must have actual intercourse with our Heavenly Father. Our minds may be drawn out towards Him. We may meditate upon His works, His mercies, His blessings. But this is not, in the fullest sense, communing with Him. In order to commune with God, we must have something to say to Him concerning our actual life. We must also talk to God about what's going on in our life. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. That's what prayer really is. It's talking to God as we're talking to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to Him. This is what prayer is about. But oftentimes as I study with people, they tell me, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, that's a very good point. Many times we do not know how to pray. Jesus had met together with His disciples, and one day they asked Him a very important question. Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. Luke chapter 11 
and verse 1. It says, And it came to pass that he was, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. He said, Lord, teach us. We would like to know how to pray. Yes, these disciples, they were at that time probably ordained ministers and they needed to learn how to pray. Well, I'm not going to read that prayer Jesus taught them right there. I'm going to go over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And let us read that one. It says, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many of you have heard that prayer. Many of you have probably memorized that prayer. And sometimes when we talk, tell people, can you pray? They repeat this prayer. But you know, that was not the purpose of this prayer. It's for us just to simply repeat it without thinking of its meaning. In the very same verses in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus went ahead and explained something about the whole issue of prayer. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7 it says, But when ye pray, use not the vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So when we're talking about praying to the Lord, we're not talking about finding a few phrases and repeating them over and over and over again. Rather, this prayer was a model prayer. We are to learn some important lessons about prayer on how to pray through these verses right here. These verses I found are basically dividing the prayer into five specific sections. We have five sections here that tell us on about prayer. In the very beginning it says, Our Father which art in heaven. Now, from this we learn that we are addressing our Heavenly Father. So the number one part here, the first part of our prayer means that we need to address to whom we are speaking. And we are speaking to our Father up in heaven. And it says here, our, Jesus said specifically, our Father. Why does He say our Father? In Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 17, it says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So why does he say to address him as our Father, simply because it, we have become children of the heavenly King. In those verses there it says, Abba, Father. In other words, like a child telling his father, Daddy. That's what it says in those verses. You see, this first part of the address means that we are having a close relationship, a father-child relationship with our God. It also recognizes something else. In Psalm chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Psalm chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. In these verses, it shows that it's recognizing who God is. Our Father, which art in heaven. It recognizes the authority of God, the greatness of God. So not only is it simply addressing Him as our Father, but it is also recognizing God's authority and greatness. The God, the God that we worship, He is a great God. He is the omniscient, all-powerful God that we worship. And so, when Jesus says we begin prayer, we must first of all direct our thoughts to that great God of the universe and realizing that that great God is our Father, that we are coming to Him as His children. The second part 
of the prayer. It says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. What did this part of the verse mean? Well, it means, quite simply, when it says that hallowed be thy name, it means that the very first thing that we ought to do is not come to God and say, Our Father which art in heaven, we're in trouble, we're in a mess. How many times we get together in prayer, we have urgent needs before us, and immediately we fall down on our knees and we cry that we're in trouble. That's not the way to pray. The way God wants us to pray is first of all, after we address Him as our God, the second thing is we are to offer praise and thanksgiving praise and thanksgiving for what what should we praise and thank him for we should praise and thank him for answered prayer in Psalm 140 verse 13 Psalm 140 verse 13 says surely thy righteous shall give thanks unto thy name the upright shall dwell in thy presence so what should we be doing? We should be giving thanks unto His name. Psalm 92 verse 1. Psalm 92 verse 1 says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto Thy name, O Most High. Now what should we praise the Lord for? When we talk about praise the Lord, what should we be praising God for? Oh, we think all the blessings that God gives us. Well, let us take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In what? In everything. Are you giving thanks in everything? How often I meet with Christians and I tell them, how are you doing? They say, terrible. Every time I ask them, oh, this is bad, that's bad, I'm sick, this is bad, all these things are going bad. This is not the life of the Christian. The life of the Christian follows this principle and it says here, in everything give thanks. Well, someone might say, yeah, but I should not be thanking the Lord for all these persecutions I'm going through. Well, what about Paul and Silas? Here they were in the prison cell together and what did they do? They praised the Lord. They were singing they were singing so loud that the prison door shook open. You see, God heard their voice and God recognized their singing and He united together with them and gave them a great earthquake. That's right, threw all the prison doors open. You see, we need to learn to praise the Lord in everything. And it says here, very clearly, in this verse it says here, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So God's will for us is to give thanks in everything. In reality, this is actually a command. In everything, give thanks. What does that mean? Well, this command actually is an assurance to us that even the things which appear to be against us will work for our good. God will not bid us be thankful for that which would do us harm. In reality here, Everything that God allows us to go through is for our benefit. It may not seem that way. Paul and Silas, when they were all being beaten up, it didn't seem like it was something good for them. But in reality, it was a blessing to them. Now, again, why is it important to give thanks unto the Lord before we go on and start giving our requests? Let's look at an example in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'm not going to read this whole chapter, although I would urge you to read verses 1 through 30. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 30. In verse 2 it talks there, there's a great multitude coming up against Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a king of Judah and he didn't know what to do. A great multitude was coming up there. Verse 3 it says that he feared. He was afraid of that great multitude and he set himself to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast throughout his region. And all of them, they gathered together to pray. And what did they pray? What was their prayer? Let's look at verse 5 and on. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, now listen to this prayer, O Lord God of 
our fathers. Art not thou the God in heaven? It begins with what? Recognizing the authority of God. Are you not the God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is not their power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? What's he doing here? Is he starting with, oh Lord, we're in trouble, we're in a big mess? These people are coming against us, what are you going to do to help us? Is that what he begins with? No. He says, Lord, you are that God. You have power. You control all these people. And now notice verse 7. He begins to talk about answered prayer. He talks about prayers that were answered. Verse 7, Art not thou that God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? Aren't you that God? That God that answered all our previous prayers. And they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name's sake. What happens is he began to list all answered prayers. And what about when we pray together today? What do we do? We get on our knees and say we're in trouble. Is that what we do? Unfortunately, that's what we do. And many times that's the reason why we do not have answers to our prayers. But rather, we, he was addressing God as the all-powerful God of the universe. And then he begins to praise and thank Him for all the wonderful things that He's been doing. He praises Him for all the historical blessings. We need to do that when we get on our knees. We need to start enumerating all the th answers to prayer that God gave us. And that will actually bolster our faith. It is amazing, as you read later on, in verse 21, they finally came that they had to go out to the battle. All the praying is done and now you've got to go to fight. Now what do you do now? Verse 21, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness, as they went out before the army to say, Praise the Lord for His mercy in the earth forever. Can you imagine this type of an army? Can you imagine the army going out to battle? Here is the army ahead of you. The enemy is there. They, they're much greater than you are. You have, with every manpower that you have, you're insignificant in comparison to their power. And what do you put on the front lines? What do you put on the very front target? You put the choir. Imagine that, a choir going in the head of the army. A choir doing what? A choir to continue praising the Lord. And then you read on there, and then because God saw their faith, that God answered their prayer directly. And you know what they had to do? The choir got all the victory. You see, they were praising the Lord, and God then fought for them, and the army didn't have to do anything. That's the plan that God has for us. And the same thing in all our prayers, all our difficulties that we experience. God wants us to experience it just like that. So this is why it's important for us to praise the Lord, first of all, for answered prayer already. And then we can go forth in victory. But you know what else it says? It says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You see, when we are praying, it is not to say, Lord, you answer my prayer. No, it is thy will be done. You see, because God answers all prayers. But you see, there are two answers that we don't like. We like a yes answer. But you know, God is not Santa Claus. Our God, He answers yes when it's for our benefit. He answers no when it's for our benefit. And He also answers wait a while when it's for our own good. That's right. That's the type of God that we worship. So we have to be willing to allow things to be given over to Him according to His will. And now we finally come to the petition part, the time to ask. Then we, the third point is finally we come to the point of being able to ask. After we've recognized His authority, after we've recognized His greatness, after we've recognized Him being our Father, our personal close relationship with Him as a child with a Father, secondly, we praised Him for answered prayer, we thanked Him for all His wonderful things, and now it's time to ask. And it's amazing what we ask for first. And the very first part says, let, let's read it again, 
Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then it says, give us this day our daily bread. Now it may seem that this is asking first of all, now finally for our daily needs. But in reality, this first of all has a spiritual meaning. You remember, what is bread? In John 6, verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. That's right. Jesus is the bread of life. And Jesus being the bread of life, we are to ask the Lord for giving us a daily part of Jesus Christ. That's our primary application. It is of a spiritual nature. First the spiritual and then the temporal. How often times we forget about the spiritual. This, we, our soul needs to be refreshed. Our soul needs strengthening. And then after we take the spiritual, and which part of the spiritual is there too? Give us this day our daily bread. Then it says there, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So here again, we find a spiritual need. Our greatest need is forgiveness of sin. Our greatest need is the forgiveness of sins. So this is why these are spiritual things, things of a spiritual nature. Now something is quite amazing in here. We want to be forgiven as we forgive our debtors. Luke chapter 11, 4 says, And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Now tell me something. How is God going to give us forgiveness? Do you want forgiveness? Well, this verse is very important because this model prayer tells us that God is going to give us forgiveness in the same way that we forgive others. If we do not forgive someone else, then God will not answer our prayers. And so many times we receive curses rather than blessings specifically because of this very point. And then it goes on. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Again, we're dealing here with spiritual needs. Lead us not into temptation. You see, among the most important needs is that we do not go into temptation. Remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 41. Matthew 26, verse 41, He told His disciples to do something. He said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. So what was His purpose there? He says, Watch and pray so you do not go into temptation. And so, lead us not into temptation. That means we are also praying that we are conscious of the need that we do not need to place ourselves in temptation. And so then we can go with the other needs, you see. So, again, let's, uh, let's remember here, it's the address, first of all, recognizing Him as our Father, the, as the one that has authority and greatness. We then praise and give, give praise and thanksgiving to Him for His wonderful blessings and looking at all the answered prayers that He has given us. Then we go to the actual petition. We go to the petition itself for the things that we request. And then we come to the closing. And the closing is very important as well. It says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And now notice in the closing, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What is the closing all about? What does the closing talk about? The closing, again, is guess what? It is praise. That's right. It is praising the Lord again. For thine is the power, thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory. 
Yes, we need to praise the Lord. We need to spend more time in praise than we are asking for things. It is amazing to me how many times we get together for prayer requests and what do we hear? Oh, help me, help me, help me, help me. And sometimes we get a little bit further. We get at least to me, myself, and I. And sometimes we get to our family. But brethren, our prayer needs to be directed to praise our Heavenly Father. And then we need to pray for those around us. We need to pray for others rather than look at only the selfish needs. So we find here that praise part is very important in the closing prayer. And also then we have the very last part, which is the Amen. In the number five here, the Amen. And Amen simply means... May the Lord let it be. Well, and by the way, these were the specific, uh, they used to be th three letters of three different words. So now, which means may the Lord let it be. So what do we have find here? We find that we ask God, we address Him as our Father, we have a close relationship with Him. He is the authority and greatness. We praise and thanks him, thank Him. We uh, then go to our petition, spiritual and then temporal, forgiveness of sins. But every time we ask it, we must recognize that it is His will to be done, Thy will to be done. And we find here that at the very closing, again we talk about His will to be done. We want to see His will to be done. So we find here that praise and having God to do His will is a very important part of this in another place, in John chapter 14 and verse 13, it says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He adds here something else. In the closing is not only prayer, but also in the closing, it needs to be in the name of Jesus. So we are to pray in Jesus' name. Now what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Again, I'd like to read from this booklet, Steps to Christ Again, on page 100 to 101. It has a very interesting thought. It says, but to pray in the name of Jesus is something more than a mere mention of that name at the beginning and the ending of a prayer. It is to pray in the mind and spirit of Jesus. While we believe His promises, rely upon His grace and work His works. So we are to be, means that we are relying upon Jesus. We have the mind of Jesus. You remember in Colossians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So God wants us to have the mind of Jesus. And we are to have the spirit and attitude of Jesus, and of course, the works of Jesus. Now let's just talk briefly a little bit about answers to prayer. In John chapter 14 and verse 13, we read, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified. Now, what does it mean, whatsoever? Does that mean that I can pray for anything and God is going to answer that? Well, let's take a look at the limitations to the word whatsoever. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything, anything? If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. So what does it say here? It says here that when we ask for anything, according to His will. So that means then that we must understand what the will of God is. We must study the Word of God to know what to pray for. It's not just to ask without thinking about it. Now, it says we need to have confidence. What does it mean to have confidence? It means that we need to pray in faith. James 4 verse 3 when we talk about asking in confidence, asking in faith, it does not mean asking in confidence for our personal vanity. James chapter 4 verse 3 says, Ye ask and receive not. Why? Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, 
that you may consume it upon your lusts. That's right. They dare go to God to ask Him to give them, to gratify their lustful appetites. And that's what they were asking. And no wonder they don't get an answer to prayer. So we are not to ask those type of things. Now another illustration here. I may sit down and ask, Oh, Lord, give me a million dollars. I need a million dollars. Well, that's a whatsoever, isn't it? But why doesn't God just sit there and say, okay, let me give you a million dollars? Well, first of all, we will consume it on our lusts. And second of all, because of Romans 12, 11. Even if we ask for $10 and sit down and do nothing, is God's not going to answer that either. He's not just the, ten, the million dollars, even $10. Why? Romans 12, 11, it says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So what is it? Not slothful in business. So if we are slothful in business, do you think God's going to answer our prayers? No. This is why it's important for us to be very diligent and then to make it possible for God to answer our prayers. In Psalm 66 verse 18, Psalm 66 and verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So if I'm hanging on to iniquity, if I'm hanging on to sin, God will not hear us. That's right. God's not going to listen to it. So we must first of all confess our sins before God before we can know what to pray for in these other cases. Another important point when we were studying about the law of God. Let's look at Proverbs 28 verse 9. Proverbs 28 verse 9. This is another thing in relationship to the law that holds us from God answering our prayers. It says, Proverbs 28 verse 9, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. That's right. So if you don't want to hear the law of God, if you don't want to listen to God's law, then what happens? Then when, when you pray, it's abominable before God. God doesn't want to hear those kind of prayers. Just to summarize this again, I'd like to read from Steps to Christ, page 95. Steps of Christ, page 95. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, if we cling to any known sin, the Lord will not hear us. But the prayer of the penitent, contrite soul is always acceptable. When all known wrongs are righted, we may believe that God will answer our petitions. Our own merit will never commend us to the favor of God. It is the worthiness of Jesus that will save us, His blood that will cleanse us, yet we have a work to do in complying with the conditions of acceptance. And the conditions of acceptance was that we do not regard iniquity in our heart. And then we are to ask in faith, James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. James chapter 1, oh, let's start with verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Oh no, let not that type of man think he's going to get something from God. No way, he will not receive. So we must then ask in faith. All prayer must be of faith. And how do we obtain faith? Romans 10 verse 17. Romans 10 verse 17. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we keep coming back to this word, my friends. Every time we turn around, we need to understand the word of God. We need to make it a part of our life. It's the only way that we can actually understand what even to pray for. We often pray for the wrong things. We don't even know we're praying for the wrong things. We had no idea it was the wrong thing. Why? Because we're ignorant of God's Word. So God wants us to read His Word. As we read it, He will show us sin. And as we confess our sins, we are in a position to be able to communicate with God. Again, Steps to Christ, page 96. A beautiful section here on prayer. Steps to Christ, page 96. When we do not receive the very things we ask for, at the time we ask, we are still to believe that the Lord hears and that He will answer our prayers. We are so erring and short-sighted that we sometimes ask for things that would not be a blessing to us, and our Heavenly Father in love 
answers our prayers by giving us that which will be for our highest good, that which we ourselves would desire if with vision divinely enlightened we could see all things as they really are. You see, God answers our prayers if we really have faith in Him. He answers our prayers in such a way that if we knew the end from the beginning like He does, we would ask for the same thing. That's a wonderful God that we have. When our prayers seem not to be answered, we are to cling to the promise, for the time of answering will surely come, and we we'll, shall receive the blessing we need most. But to claim that prayer will always be answered in the very way and for the particular thing that we desire is called presumption. God is too wise to err and too good to withhold any good thing from them that walk uprightly. Then do not fear to trust Him, even though you do not see the immediate answers to your prayer. Rely upon His sure promise, ask and it shall be given you. Now, one more thing before we close this study is how often are we to pray? How often do we need to pray? Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10 gives us an illustration of Daniel in captivity and how often he prayed. Daniel 6 verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in the chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he did before time. His custom was to kneel down three times a day. And this brings us to an important point. Throughout the Bible as we study the pro, pro, the posture that we should have in prayer, we find that these men of God, they humbled themselves and they knelt down on their knees when they prayed before God. They did not just sit there standing up. Oh no, they realized they were in front of the king of the universe and the appropriate way to talk to the king of the universe, the appropriate way to ask something from the king of the universe is on our knees. We belong on our knees, my friend. And Daniel kneeled on his knees three times a day. Now, this did not mean those were his only time of prayer. That means those were the time of prayer that he prayed on his knees. On his knees he was three times a day. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. That's right, pray without ceasing. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? Again, Steps to Christ, page 101. Steps to Christ, page 101. God does not mean that any of us should become hermits or monks and retire from the world in order to devote ourselves to acts of worship. The life must be like Christ's life between the mountain and the multitude. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray or his prayers will become formal and routine. That's right. If that's all we do is pray, pray, pray and do nothing else, we'll either stop praying or we'll be, have a bunch of formal prayers. When men take themselves out of social life, away from the sphere of Christian duty and cross-bearing, when they cease to work earnestly for the Master who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. They cannot pray in regard to the wants of humanity or the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom, pleading for strength wherewith to work. We need to pray for what? For strength to work, not strength to do nothing. No, no. God wants His people to have a life of active activity. To pray not for ourselves, but to pray for the needs that are around us. Union with God. It means that we're going to be talking with God constantly. We have the example of Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. What did Nehemiah do? It says here, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I pray to the God of heaven. Notice here, Nehemiah was in a, quite a precarious situation. The king realized that something was wrong with Nehemiah. Nehemiah was coming in his presence. And he thought, oh, something is the matter here. And what did Nehemiah do immediately? He was already having an open channel with God. He immediately communicated with God. He dashed a prayer up to heaven. So it means that we are having a continual communication with the king of the universe. In conclusion, I'd like to read another paragraph here from this book 103 to 104. It says, we must gather about the cross. 
Christ and Him crucified should be the theme of contemplation, of conversation, and of our most joyful emotion. We should keep in our thoughts every blessing we receive from God. And when we realize His great love, we should be willing to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. The soul may ascend nearer heaven on the wings of praise. God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above. And as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of our heavenly hosts. It is important for us to remember the purpose of prayer. It's important for us to remember the, the, the prayer that God gave while He was on this earth was a model prayer, not simply to be repeated without thinking of the meaning, but it was simply to show us how we are to pray. And with these thoughts upon our mind, I'd like to close with Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, Let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may find grace and help in time of need. Right now, God is asking you, do you want to have that close relationship with Him? Then come boldly before the throne of grace and talk to your Heavenly Father.